Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Helmer. Now, guess what? Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. I'm a big fan of video learning. I used it to learn editing when I set up this podcast. And recently, I came across a great tool that helps you make instructional videos really quickly and easily. It's called Powtoon. If you saw a video trailer on the way to this podcast, did that using Powtoon. It's ridiculously easy to get your head round and has a huge library of assets and templates that save an awful lot of time. It's got 26 million users worldwide and L&D teams love it. There's a jealousy in the team. Like everybody wants to play with the fun tool. You know? <laughs> they just launched their business platform with great collaboration features, the ability to apply your own branding and a lot of support to ensure your videos make an impact. Even better, they're offering 20% off any Powtoon business plan plus one month free exclusively for listeners to this podcast. Just visit go.powtoon.com slash learning hack to secure your discount now. Well, after you've listened to this podcast, of course. Something a bit different this time on The Learning Hack. Last week, I visited Learning Technologies Exhibition and Conference at London's Excel, which is about the most important industry event in our space on this side of the Atlantic. Over the years, I've run stands there as a marketing director, reported the conference, given the odd talk, gone some years just to check out what everyone was up to and meet old friends. But this year, I went as a roving reporter for the podcast, pointing my trusty device at whoever looked like they might have something interesting to say. This show has grown quite a bit since I first came in 1999, and I wanted to give a rounded picture of the event now from all different angles. So I talked to conference delegates and speakers, industry analysts, exhibitors, exhibition visitors, and the next generation of entrepreneurs will no doubt be on the stands here in a year or two's time. First off the bat, at an eve of show networking event, I ran into my old friend Ken of Now Communications, a fellow e-learning lifer, who usually runs exit surveys at Learning Tech, but this year for the first time had taken the plunge and was hiring a stand. Apologies for a bit of wind noise, by the way. I'd bought a lovely new windshield from my recorder, but stupidly managed to leave it at home. I asked Ken, what were his expectations for the show? My first expectation was I hope it looks a lot better than it did today, uh, because I've never been one of these people that has to do that pre-show, whatever the word is for getting it all ready. And uh, that was a disaster for me. I was like, how are they going to get everything ready for tomorrow? There's carpeting everywhere, there's yeah. bits everywhere, there's bits of stand, there's people in yellow, you know, um, yeah. Julie Jean jackets and stuff. Yeah. God, you're such I'm... a virgin. <laughs> I really am. No, I am. I've never done that. We just kind of rock up and yeah. do our stuff. So, Well, listen, uh, I remember turning up once to um, a show at a uh, CIPD show in Harrogate, and they hadn't even built the stand. They said, oh, you, you, um, you contracted for space only. There's no Chelsea. Yeah, yeah. There's always a, a vicious No, we didn't. Evil and it turned surprise. out we ticked the wrong box or whatever. And um, so they had to build the sand while we waited and, right. and, and then paid for every single little piece of stuff. That's probably quite visually stimulating, though, if you want to attract people to your stand, you know, to have something that's that obscure. Anything obscure gets noticed. Really. You know, we're a marketing company that markets to most of the companies that are at the show these people might maybe make the effort to come and have a stroll and talk to us and that would be it so I'm kind of excited about that whether that's going to be a good idea or not good um, do you think the show's still relevant? trade show's relevant or these the shows still relevant I mean, well like I'll tell you yeah them. I'll tell you what we do so much research around all these shows honestly we do I know we're a marketing company and uh, and a lot of people don't respect um research and that's fair enough but you know we are pretty glued on to this market and uh, of all the shows that are in the UK this is always the one that we recommend because it is really the one that has buzz around it and it's the one that everybody respects everybody so understands still the, the show. show I think so I mean yeah I think so and moving it to Excel has been a great idea learning technologies has not always been held at its current venue in Docklands It was previously in West London at Olympia, a Victorian exhibition centre that comes with its problems. Making the move from Olympia to Excel, however, did not go all that smoothly for what could be seen as a competitor show to learning technologies, the CIPD's HRD show. Word on the street was that visitor numbers suffered and eventually it ended up back at Olympia, rebranded as the Festival of Work. The CIPD show has gone through so many evolutions 
and it reinvents itself consistently. It's kind of like Doctor Who in that respect. It keeps yeah. trying to do something new. And a lot of these shows are, are the same. I would really love to see, I'll tell you what I'd love to see, not that you're asking me, but I'll tell you anyway. I'd love to see a show that, that sort of understood the, the relevance of online and offline, because I think there's an awful lot of shows that are really good at doing offline stuff. Learning tech here is fantastic at that. It will give you a great spot. It will do everything to make that experience, that human manual sort of experience you have on the day, around the day, and, and at the show. It's going to do everything it possibly can around that. Um, but then somebody has to come along and do a great offline experience, as in, sorry, a great online experience along with that to, to sort of fuse together the whole journey that you take those people on because your customers are really looking to to come and, and get to know you somewhere, whether it's online or whether it's at a show or something. And then they're needing this huge, big, long nurture process to, to actually get them to convert and to buy. And that's not all about one thing or the other. It's about doing two things in a really cohesive and, and orchestrated way. So the same um, divide between... Yeah, and I still, see a, and yeah, I still see a huge chasm between people doing things well online, which I think is us. We do, we do all that bit and people doing things well offline, which is people like Learning Tech and, and some of the big trade shows that you get here. Yeah. And, uh, and one of these days, somebody's gonna come along and do the whole thing from end to end really well, but yeah. we're just not quite there yet. Thanks, Ken, and I'm sure the organizers of Learning Technologies will be in touch to ask for your help. The networking event where we met was run by the analyst company Fosway, and I took the opportunity to grab a chat with their senior analyst, Fiona Lettany. How long has she been coming here? Do you know, I can't remember how long I've been coming to this show because I've been in the learning technologies in industry for probably 20 years now. In fact, yeah, it is 20 years because I was selling learning systems back, back in the day. And then since then, I've come back when I have been either implementing them or even managing them as a corporate. So it's sort of dip in and dip out. And now as Fosway, we we actually have a stand and and uh, you know. Now your job is as an analyst. Of Absolutely, systems. yeah. It's been really quite interesting over the last twelve months because learning systems is is really um, changing. Another fixture in the calendar is the appearance each January of Fosway's nine grid tables, which come out not entirely coincidentally in the run up to the Learning Technologies Show. Fiona is heavily involved in the Nine Grid for Learning Systems, which this year made quite a dramatic change in how it views the market. We have this year decided that rather than classify it as learning management systems and next-gen learning environments, that they, they be, were becoming so similar in their functionality that it was no longer a helpful classification for a buyer. The change has been to divide learning systems into suites, many of them LMS-style systems that have upgraded to add next-generation functionality, and specialists. I asked her what the specialist category entailed. Specialists are those that are more likely to uh, be integrated into an ecosystem, possibly with another suite. So the, the specialist can be anything from mobile specialist, programmatic learning, adaptive learning, but it's trying to give the buyer a better feel for what um, the new kids on the block are doing yeah. rather than just calling them either a next-gen learning environment. It's a controversial change in some quarters. I put it to her that this might be seen to have relegated some fully featured platforms, including many genuine learning experience platforms, to the status of point solutions. So that's a really good good point. And um, on the grid, the, we have a vertical scale, which is about potential. And for the learning systems on that uh, particular scale, we look at the functionality. And some, some systems that are perhaps be, at the lower band, they are very specific, they're very niche. They will just be that, if you like, point scale, where there is more on the mid um, band of potential. They are likely to have not just the, the focus, but they will have other, um, other functionality as well. That they'll almost be a suite, but actually they don't want to necessarily be a suite. They want to be able, because they do what they do better than the suites do. 
okay. if that makes sense. And my other question really about that is how durable do you think this is? Because you had to change the previous mm -hmm. classification. Will you have to change it again another one? We will, we will watch the market and we will change if the, the market deems it necessary to change. Um, we are, at the moment, what we have is one grid that has both sweets and specialists on that same grid. We have increased the numbers. Last year there were 33 on the learning systems grid, this year there are 44. And it is... It, there are a lot of systems that new new kids on the block are coming um, onto the market, having limiting by sort of the geographic size of the grid is is actually not um, potentially you know looking at the at the future. So we may have to split in some some way, but we will just watch the market and see what makes the most sense for the buyers, so that we can give the you know a, a, the best advice the best uh, way of not you know not the music the market's not confusing we want to be able to uh, give the best direction for any buyer um, so it'll change as we you know as we think uh, it needs to my name is Karsten Storgård I work for a company called Lerdale we produce mannequins for um, CPR training. One of the great things about an event like Learning Tech is the chance meetings you have, the unexpected and serendipitous encounters. In the lunch break next day, I happened to be sat next to Carsten, a conference goer whose work put a whole different spin on learning technologies. This was not something you had to sit at a screen to experience. In fact, I half seriously accused him of being in robotics. So I was interested to see if the themes of the conference resonated differently for him. What are drawn into the event? I'm here to look at how we can support the daily life of, for instance, nurses and other people in working in the health industry. Um, so we're not just providing training, but actually supporting uh, their day, daily performance. Yeah. And you've been up in the conference. What have you seen this morning? This morning I saw the, the general keynote, and then I went to this uh, Bob Marshall sen session on uh, workflow learning. Yeah. Yeah. I was in that. What did you think of that? I thought it was interesting. His uh, he was quite provocative, but in <laughs> in a in a in a nice fashion and a nice manner. He had one of his uh, opening statements were that we in the training industry need to move out of the training business and move into the performance business. Yeah. So that is uh, an interesting take and, and quite a change in I think the regular L and D way. Uh, but the department's way of looking at itself. Yeah, and this is interesting given your um, the, the, the product you make and sell, the, 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 the mannequin, which is a kind of training robot in a sense. Exactly. Um, and he was talking very much about, you know, less of the kind of PowerPoint ring binder type of training and more of the actual transfer into the workplace exactly. practice. And exactly. That's exactly what the, the area of the, the whole process that you're involved in. Mm -hmm. Yes, this general idea of, of transfer, you know, moving from from the training room, the classroom, and out into the real world, and, and how you would apply what you have learned, has always been challenging, I think. Um, and we had to get our head around that, uh, how we, you know, provide different training assets or ways of, of supporting uh, regular day-to-day -day performance out there. Yeah. Um, and you, you were saying that learning technology is a pretty important show for you. Absolutely. I think when it comes to the, uh, if we look at the European conference market in this, in this uh, field, in this industry, there is learning technologies in London that is quite in the, the go-to place. Uh, there's a big expo um, and the regular, or the, the, the conference, the paid conference, uh, the quality of, of the speakers there is just so... It's just so great compared to, I believe, anything you see in, in Europe. You also referenced online educa, yes, um, and which also serves the education sector. Now, education and organisation training are very separate mm -hmm. silos yes. over yes. here. Yeah. Is that the case in Denmark as well, or uh, I would say absolutely yes. I worked for two uh, universities and um, two other higher ed institutions in Denmark, actually. So, so I've been in and out of corporate and in and out of higher ed mm. uh, quite a few times. And it seems that, you know, 
one approach could inform the other, one industry could inform the other, but uh, I agree with you that it's it's uh, very siloed. Yeah. Um, and I guess for many reasons, there's something about maybe for the educational sector as such, per se, the, uh, you know, learning or training is kind of the, the product in itself. Yeah. And when it comes to corporates, L&D is kind of, I wouldn't say just an afterthought, but it's 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 a supportive uh, department and, and not not the key product itself. So there's something about the positioning of, you know, where is learning in an organisation. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Let's come back to, to the product you make. Yeah. Can you see applications of that kind of thing in other areas apart from healthcare? I mean, I, I jokingly said you've got a robot there, but but actually we're moving into an age of. Um, robotics and cobots um, and you know, various types of assistive systems um, that will come into the workplace. Do you, how do you see your business developing? That trend here? I think we are very focused on um, on helping save lives. So I think in our, you know, as far as our mission and company goes, we will stick to that industry. But of course, this idea of having um, Artificial intelligence of having robotics uh, as a training means um, will be valuable for other industries as well. The idea is, of course, that the more you digitize, the more data uh, comes out of it. And having data as a driver uh, in order to monitor the efficacy and efficiency of your training uh, is, of course, important. Not only as an afterthought, but also when you design training programs, just the idea of you being able to think about what kind of data is it that we need to gather and yeah. for what purpose. So that is a conversation that needs to happen very early on, on in the process. And I think that there is still room for improvement, uh, not only in our industry, but you know, in, in learning, uh, the learning industry as such. Mm. Um, and you were saying that you have quite a, a, an extended sort of chain between you and the actual learner. You, you sell into companies, you then sell to um, organisations, um, and then yes. the learner kind of is at the end of that chain. Yeah, yeah. Can you yeah. talk a bit about how data is beginning to let you shorten that chain? Or? Let me give you an example. We have we have a partnership with the American Heart Association, yeah. and. Um, we're moving into a so-called low-dose, high-frequency training program with the American hospitals. So the idea is that instead of you know training one time every second year just to recertify yourself, we now move into a circle or a cycle of um, training every three months. So it's a smaller dose, that is the low-dose high thing, and then the high frequency is every three months. And we can now see that compared, you know, the baseline, the first time they trained and how they're improving now with the first quarter, third quarter, or second quarter, third quarter, and so on, uh, that people are improving. And it also means that we can kind of figure out, you know, what is it that people are still not very good at. And that data will inform the way we design our training programs as we move on in time here. Very good feedback, Luke. Mm, yeah. Um, and what are you looking forward to seeing at the rest of the conference? Is there, is there anything that lets out for the speaker you particularly want to see? <clears throat> I think there's still something about becoming wiser with regards to the data field, learning analytics as such. And then also this, uh, there are quite a few tracks on, or sessions on, on this uh, learning in the flow of work. Yeah. And, uh, and how we can support performance. Yeah. And that, is, that will be my focus during the rest of the conference. Carsten was sitting with a group of colleagues from Denmark. The show draws visitors now from Europe and around the world, and also from the Americas. When I managed to grab a few minutes with Connie Malamud, the internationally famed expert on learning design after a workshop she'd been running, I asked her how it stacks up against shows she goes to in the States. One thing I love about the show is the international audience. It's, um, since most of the conferences I go to that are in the States, um, I don't... It's fun for me to see the problems and challenges and obstacles that, are, that other people are dealing with. The expo is a very, very big part of this conference. All the vendors uh, come here, and it's a very large part of it. But yet they still manage to have great sessions and attract very smart people. You know, I 
just did a session. I was just really impressed with the great ideas that people had and the good questions that they had. Do you think this is a different culture around learning um, in Europe than um, the U.S.? I don't feel like I'm an expert enough to know to give a a 100% answer, but I really see people dealing with the same issues over and over again in both places. But do they deal, deal with them differently? I don't think I know enough about that. I mean, from what I got from today, it seemed very similar. Connie's website is called Do You Learning Coach, but most of her work centers around learning design, and she's described various different ways in what she does as an instructional designer, as a learning experience designer. I asked her if she felt there was a real difference beyond a purely semantic one between being an instructional designer, which is now rather an old school term, and being a learning experience designer, the newer, more modish one. I see the difference between, even though I tend to use the terms uh, synonymously often, I do see instructional design as a subset of learning experience design. So that would mean that the reason I think that the terminology change is good is because I think that learning experience design means you're not necessarily designing an ex- a course. It could be that you're designing anything that will help people improve performance and it takes into account user experience design and borrows from a lot of different fields. Uh, so that's how I see the difference between the two words. Instructional design is more of a practice to get at that analysis. In learning experience design, it's a little more wide open. We can do design thinking, we can do user experience, use user experience tools, we can also use instructional design best practices. Yeah. You've just led a work- workshop in using um, design thinking. Um, is that an important part of your, your practice nowadays? It certainly depends on what I problem I'm trying to solve. Okay. And I often work alone. And design thinking is best done in a collaborative environment. That said, I am always borrowing parts from design thinking, in particular the whole aspect of human-centered design, having empathy for the learners or users, and defining the correct problem. I also always prototype, too, if I'm designing instructional materials, I always prototype and try to test it or show stakeholders, just try to get it out there before trotting down a path that may fail. Okay. And you know that design thinking does have its detractors in the learning space, don't you? Right. What would you say to, you know, um, we got my, um, to we people who say that design thinking is, uh, doesn't have a place? Yeah. Anyway, the, the way story. I've worked it out when I teach workshops is to use design thinking as a framework and then to do your entire instructional design part during the define, the define phase. So during the define phase you can do your analysis because you're trying to define the problem. You can do your action mapping, uh, Kathy Moore's action mapping, or you can do any type of content analysis. So um, I don't really care that some people say that. They don't have to use it. It's really just what up to whatever is going to help you, each individual, do the best job they can. So for some people, it's going to be design thinking. Some people might hate it, and that's fine. Immersive learning experiences are transforming the way we work, play, and learn. And there's one company I've followed for years who have been pioneering in the use of virtual and augmented reality to enhance learning and boost outcomes. Make Real lead the field in validating the use cases of immersive technologies for everything from soft skills to health, safety and well-being. If you attended Learning Technologies 2020 at London Excel, you might have spoken with their team or heard a case study from one of their clients, Lloyd's Banking Group. Don't worry if you didn't, they'll be back next year bigger and badder than ever. Make Real moves beyond just hard skills like maintenance and carrying out virtual dangerous activities with a flourishing catalogue of interpersonal soft skills training around diversity, well-being, mental health, coaching and much more. Talk to Make Real about using Immersive to drive real-world outcomes with bottom-line benefits. Check out their shiny new website, makereal.co.uk, for more use case studies. Make a note of it now in real life. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Nice to see you. There's a, there's a tab. Yeah, so you can steal the right? It is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, mate, it's called, cool. it's bar camp, right? So, behind the bar. So, just ask for that and get a drink. As they grow in size, trade shows tend to spawn fringe events. 
I ran one myself alongside learning technologies for a number of years. And with the conference over after the first day of the show, I'm visiting a very successful fringe event called Bar Camp run by my friend Martin Cousins. I asked him why he decided to put the event on. I think it's, it's the idea of going, you know, fishing where the fish are. Although clearly I'm not trying to disparage out the lovely people that come to this. They're not fish. But basically it's a two day event, people potentially staying over. So why not find a bar really close to the venue so no one, you know, you, people don't drop off because they, go, they have to travel a long way to the bar. Yeah. So it's really close and you try and extract some speakers from the event in the pub and people just would like, you know, the idea was just could they have an interesting conversation with someone at the conference in the pub at the end of day one. That, and um, I tried it out. And it was really successful, yeah. So what did he think of the main event that his event was piggybacking on learning technologies? I find it hard to pick out the, the vendors that are doing really interesting things. And the reason that is, is because when I cast my eyes down the aisles, the messaging is quite similar. Yeah. So it's really hard to know what distinguishes one from another. But there's, there's quite a lot of, you know, um, talk of um, learning experience and, you know, it, innovating the learning experience. But I just don't know what that means in terms of what's being sold. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm slightly at a loss to know yeah. what's really innovative out of all of that. Did he think that Fosway's new way of dividing up the market into sweets and specialists was going to make any change to the way that companies describe themselves? It will change. I, no, I, I think it will because there's increasing co conversation around you know, technologies doing certain jobs. This idea of the learning tech stack or the, the ecosystem, you know, it's like that in the rest of the business. So why wouldn't it be like that in learning? It's like that in marketing. So I think I think that will actually start to, we'll start to see a lot more of that as, a, as an approach. And lastly, I, I see you've got to go and group business as well. But, but lastly, it's still a hot show, still worth coming. Will you be coming next year? Oh, I will. I, I absolutely love doing this event. So um, it's great to have people coming together. You know, it, you know, it's, it's the bit, stuff between the cracks, isn't it, I think, that you actually, um, you want the conversation, you want people to connect around the issues that they're facing and, and and that continues to happen at all these events so I really like that and I you know and I would like to see a shift in what the vendors are saying next year around this sort of specialism in particular. For day two of the conference I was joined by a good friend of the Learning Hack podcast Caroline Ford, ex of Thomas Cook, now working with AstraZeneca who appeared in episode five More Dash Than Cash. Caroline and I took our places for the day's opening keynote in a hall that was slowly filling up to the sound of some sweet, funky music. To the backing of James Brown, <laughs> would you like to say what your expectations are for the, the conference? Well, firstly, what a great way to start the day with the godfather of soul. Um, so my expectations for the conference are really high this year, John. There's been a huge buzz about this particular uh, Learning Technologies 2020 conference. So I'm really looking forward to spending a bit of time uh, looking at learning to love uh, data, analytics. I'm looking for transformational change stories to inspire me. I'm looking at what the future might look like, maybe three, four, five, six years ahead of where we are today. And really, I just want to get inspired. So I'm really looking forward to today. It's going to be great. Good. And we'll catch up later and share notes on what you actually saw. Love to. My name is uh, Morten Setlitz. I am from a company called Galder Studio. Um, and I'm here together with my colleague. Uh, I'm Anders Seidel, I'm a developer or slash CTO in, uh, in the Galder. Uh, yeah, we're a um, startup from Norway, doing um, making a, an authoring uh, platform for, yeah, for uh, 3D learning games. We used to joke as exhibitors that a well-timed bomb in the pub over the road from Olympia during learning technologies would take out the entire UK learning industry. 
Oh, the dark humour of those less dark days. And it's this show's ability to give you a snapshot of a whole business sector that makes it an ideal opportunity for so many people, not least for startups who have an innovative new learning product and are looking to enter the market. Martin and Anders, a couple of young Norwegian entrepreneurs, have come over to do their research. So after a day here, I asked them, how's it going? A part of it has just been walking around and, and as Martin said, uh, finding out what is actually out there and, and who would be our competitors and uh, sort of where do we fit in in the, in the market. But um, we've also been looking a lot at um, how these other um, companies are doing their marketing and what the sort of trends are as well and um, as, as well as going to some talks and, and hearing about um, statistics and, and analytics from the from the industry as a whole and, and also where where everything is moving. So, yeah. Is there anything that sells to you as being yeah. particularly great? Yeah, great. I would say that there is definitely a difference between this technology like field, like in learning tech, as opposed to all the techs which we are familiar with. Because it's a little bit holier in terms of what they want to do. And when you look at other, like, a little bit like they have a holier goal, you know, like a, a better goal, you know, they want to do something for other people. They want to get people to, to actually gain skills. Yeah. They want to provide that kind of technology. You see in other technologies, they do the opposite. They might harvest some data or whatever, and then they use it for some, some other purposes. So, so it's great to see some of the things in terms of how they want to increase the benefits from learning through personalization so you actually know you don't take the same class kind of thing. And that's how we're always thinking has been as well. There's a lot of streamlines. You are doing the same thing over and over again. It gets quite repetitive. And now people are trying to emerge in technologies that lets it be a little bit more immersive or engaging. Yeah. How do you see yourself fitting in well, we learned a new word, actually, which is uh, blended learning. Blended learning? Yeah. Well, that has been around. That's yeah. <laughs> it's new for us, and we, we kind of see ourselves as uh, a part of the blending lear- blended learning ecosystem. It definitely fits in where there is nobody else the today. Ecosystem is probably a bit of a sexy word. Yes. We want to fit into the ecosystem, and we don't want to compete. We are not an LMS, and we're not a content creator. We are the authoring platform. Yeah. which could fit with other authoring platforms just to make like a bit more blended uh, because today it seems a lot of similarities between the technologies the LMSs looks basically the same the same promises yeah. yeah there are not that many companies focusing on the same things that we are so but we, we can see that um, we can we definitely have something to give and, and something um, to offer for um, yeah, both for the LMS companies and for uh, content providers. Yeah, mm. content providers, definitely. So job done. And we look forward to seeing Martin and Anders back here in a couple of years' time, perhaps, flogging their wares. It was really interesting to hear them enthusing about blended learning, an idea so familiar to us old lags that we barely use it anymore, let alone thinking about it. Something else that we now almost take for granted is 70-20-10, the observation that 70% of learning happens on the job, 20% through social interaction, and only 10% in formal settings like classroom courses or e-learning modules. Up in the conference, I got the chance to speak to Vivian and Joss, founders of the 70-20-10 Institute, and to ask them what sort of impact those ideas have had in practice. We began by talking about a conference session we'd all attended, a case study about learning analytics within Network Rail, given by Guy Wilmshurst-Smith. It's quite interesting uh, to see that uh, people are talking much more about the connection between learning and performance, like we saw this morning a very good example uh, of that, yes, about the learning analytics, where we really see that it's talking, not only talking about performance, but you can show some improvements in the performance, and that's really interesting because last couple of years people were much more talking about it, and you couldn't see that it really was happening. In terms of the learning interventions, you saw that the focus was still on the formal learning interventions, Uh, although he also uh, uh, took a look at the environmental issues that uh, influences the performance, but if you take a look at the solutions, then uh, it was, at least in this, uh, of of, of course, in this session, there was a focus on the formal learning stuff. My feeling is that uh, 
people in L&D profession, they like to uh, to go beyond formal learning. Yeah. So there's a lot of interest in workplace learning and that kind of stuff. And I think the pitfall for our profession is that we do the same stuff, but do it just not in, not in e-learning, not in the classroom, but on the workplace. So I think there's a really desire and also a really business need to change our profession, to change the way we are, uh, we are dealing with formal learning and go beyond that. And I think um, 70 2010 is um, from a mindset. Yeah, from a mindset uh, mindset uh, approach, it's good to to go beyond formal learning. But we need more solutions. We need more innovations in our field because we are stuck still into formal learning, and I think that's uh, challenging for us. So we're still stuck in the 10 percent. Surely things have moved on a bit with all the talk of learning experiences, the ecosystem. The language at least has changed a lot. Yeah, I think we, we in our profession, we like to, uh, to reframe the same services. So now we talk, about, we talk about workplace learning, we talk about social learning, and we talk about uh, things that really uh, are not changed because this is all formal learning and it's on the workplace level, it's connected to social learning, but it's not really um, uh, as 302010 meant to be because we, in, from our idea, we think we have to support people at work. And it can be with learning, it can be with performance support, it can be with all kinds of other uh, interventions. Yeah. But in, uh, in, uh, as you can see in uh, the State of Industry reports of the last 10 years, yeah. uh, the, four, the core business of uh, L&D is still formal learning. Yeah. So we don't change that much. And what do you think we need to do to change that? We need to, uh, we need to broaden our view on learning. Right now we, only, uh, we try to innovate and to, uh, to improve formal learning. But we have to go uh, beyond formal learning, we have to go to informal learning and also take the next step to organization learning. And in my new book, I will uh, describe how we can do this uh, as L&D. Looking forward to that, and when the book comes out, um, I hope you'll come on the podcast. Okay, yep. Thank you. Thank you. So with the event drawing to a close and a return to real life in sight, it's only fair that we give the last word to a practitioner, one of the learning and development professionals whose day-to-day toils at the work face are really the prime focus of this large and rather sprawling two-day event. A complimentary glass of wine in hand, I caught up with Caroline Ford to get her take on her day at the conference. We started the day on a real high you can't get a better facilitator than than Don Taylor he's an absolute dream he kicked it off with passion and verve and real energy um, dovetailing right nicely into uh, Daniel J Hume um, who's from the Department of Computer Science at the University uh, College London we had an amazing presentation from Daniel on all things AI, the risk, the reward, and the extraordinary possibilities of that. And I think my one real comfort from, from Daniel's presentation was, although AI is very present and almost omnipresent, um, he said we don't need to worry about anything. So that was really reassuring. Yeah. I then went to see Patty, uh, Patty Shank. Yeah. She's the president of um, Learning Peaks. She did a, a really amazing session on um, writing for instruction and how that differs from other kinds of writing. She's one of um, the most um, high profile gurus in learning, really. She's definitely in that top 10, isn't she? She is, and she was really inspiring. I mean, really great to get someone. She has a um, different cultural perspective coming from the States. She had some really interesting uh, talk, uh, talking points, actually. She talked a lot about memory, uh, sensory memory, environment, the perception piece. She talked about working memory and then she talked about long-term memory and she really focused on how to write in order to maximise the benefit of long-term memory. She said training alone um, at the end of an event just is never going to be enough. You're going to need to do something more to reinforce the content that you've written about, the content the learner has received. Very much in tune with actually some of the messaging We've heard before from the 702010 Institute. Yeah. I gather there, there was a rather kind of unorthodox approach to taking questions. Crikey, was there ever, John? The, uh... 
my feeling is that that it did derail it a, a little bit so i love patty she's really inspiring her messaging was on point really well at the beginning of the session she had a, a guy who was asking some great questions i have to be honest um, and patty invited him up on stage she pulled up a chair she gave him a mic Honestly, I'm not sure that that was um, the right thing to do. I feel he then maybe took advantage of that a little bit. Yeah. He asked some questions, perhaps not quite so relevant to Patty's core topic that she wanted to cover. Uh, she then ended up maybe going down a bit of a rabbit hole with him on a couple of occasions. There was one or two uh, disgruntled noises coming from the audience. I would have liked the facilitator to have taken more ownership and responsibility and stepped up and helped Paddy get out of that situation. Yeah. Uh, I left before the end of that session. Yeah. Someone else told me afterwards that the facilitator had come in uh, to stop the guy towards the last three or four minutes of the session so that Patty could uh, finish up and close down. In my professional opinion, it was, it was too little too late. Yeah, she yeah. needed help earlier. Right. So, so that was a bit disappointing, but nevertheless, some really valuable messages from Patty yeah. that really resonated and they were on point. So moving on, I think the next thing you did was the Women in Learning. Yeah, oh my God, I absolutely loved this session. I loved it. And um, it, it was just so great. The lady that delivered the session was Sharon Claffey. Um, and she is just phenomenal. I have to get her name right because it's Sharon Claffey Kalubi. Um, and, and she was just absolutely marvellous. She is the VP of the North America Learning Pool and um, she's been hired uh, really for her passion about women in business. You know, she did an amazing activity in the session. She got all the women, and there were some men, yeah. absolutely some men in the room. Glad to hear that. Mm. She got everyone in the room to reach out to a woman that she's working with right now, or a great friend, and to text them a message about something positive about what they do at work. Right. Real positive reaffirmation that our women, our girlfriends, our co-workers, our colleagues uh, in business, we need more than a transactional relationship with those women. We need to reinforce that what they're doing is a great job yeah. uh, and reward and recognise them for that just in small ways. Uh, I loved that. I absolutely loved it. Um, she also had some really great advice about um, maybe how to uh, re return or reposition with some some language patterns when perhaps a woman might feel that she's she's maybe being put down a little bit or she's not feeling so comfortable because of yeah. something that she's she said she had a couple of really nice pieces that I'd like to share so she she said what well, you know what happens when a man builds on a woman's idea and suddenly it's become his in that yeah. meeting right yeah never done that no 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 I know you wouldn't John yeah, right, there, there, might however be. there are some who might yeah, um, I've seen it happen yeah so she came up with a great sentence and, and it was something along the lines of uh, a retort that says, Steve, uh, that's a great idea you've built on Carrie's original thinking. I love that. Carrie, let's loop that back round again. Tell me a little bit more about what you were thinking right. and how that complements what Steve's just said. So I thought that was really nice. She also had a great response for when perhaps a man has complimented you on the way you look rather than what you've said yeah. or done. Um, she said always say thank you because it's genuinely nice to be complimented on the way that you look so her response to that was uh, thanks very much that's lovely really appreciate that comment um, quick question have you read my latest report on whatever it's on she said bring that conversation back to the business piece or reputational piece you want to be remembered for yeah. so it's a brilliant piece of advice from Sharon I watched a couple of other sessions, but I, there's one that really resonates for me. And, yeah. and actually, um, it was the last session that I went to and, and possibly the least represented in terms of the number of people there because it was right at the end of the day. Again, it was um, Sharon co-facilitating this time with a really incredible presenter, um, Louise Van Vuke. Uh, she's the Director of Sustainability Education and Engagement at AstraZeneca. So she is somebody that I'd come across in a work context, although she doesn't work in my L&D team, she works in a, in a different one. We have one. quite a federated structure. We do have a very federated structure, uh, and that's great in some ways, and, um, and, and not so great in others. But actually, I'd come across Louise because because of the piece of work she was talking about today, which was really interesting. 
And um, this is a topic that's not for the faint-hearted. The topic was um, kickstarting compliance in the digital era. I've fallen asleep already. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and you could tell by the number of people in the audience, actually. It was the end of the day. Yeah. It's not the most... Um, thrilling topic typically. Um, the facilitator was excellent in this session yeah. um, it was Anthony Williams obviously quite passionate about this topic himself and, and to help the girls present really well he encouraged everyone from the sides of the room to come and sit in okay. the centre so really cohesive um, uh, approach to running the session and um, both Sharon and Louise were able to bring some really incredible dynamic experience around how they have created learner centric approaches to compliance training. Sharon in a banking and finance setting, Louise in a highly regulated pharmaceutical setting. So some of the takeaways that I took from that was really around put this, the learner at the center of your research before you develop your compliance training. Reach out to people who are going to consume your learning, who work in different settings. What I took from Sharon was, why do we do one-size-fits-all compliance training when people are actually applying the compliance lessons in different settings? If I'm in manufacturing, I probably don't know that need the same level of compliance or structure of compliance training or delivered in the same way as someone in a head office function. Yeah. So that was a great um, message. Uh, from Louise, she, she did a heavy focus on getting the end user really involved in brainstorming and crowdsourcing what a great compliance module would look like before she started. Yeah. But she did something really innovative with this. She went outside the learning management system to advertise her product. So before she did a learning module on compliance, she created in partnership with Sponge, who are awesome yeah. in the e-learning space, she created a series of videos. Um, they're, they're sort of they were videos that touched on um, whistleblowing, slightly uncomfortable topics, and she yeah. said they started these small video snippets quite softly, mm. and as the campaign to market the compliance training ramped up, the uh, topics and the scenarios got more uncomfortable, finishing with a boss who was quite inappropriate with his colleague in terms of massaging her shoulders in a closed room in a private environment that she clearly felt uncomfortable with yeah. um, and she gave all of this kind of hashtag uh, status and then posted it on work book face workplace Facebook I have to get that right yeah. um, and and it just allowed the voice of the people to comment on what was on there she said it was amazing wasn't hashtag me too it was that was like a much longer hashtag you got written down there so. oh do you know what she inspired me actually for a hashtag you. for something yeah. I'm working on at the minute right so I'm, I'm working on a digital a piece around digital data and mm. analytics capability across AstraZeneca on a global a global platform and actually, Louise really inspired me about the way that you can use hashtags to really get people engaged on a social right. platform around some of that stuff. So her key messages were, whatever you're doing in the compliance space, it has to have global appeal. Yeah. It, it, language shouldn't be a barrier. She got people to talk on video in their own language and then had... Um, uh, running translation in English along the bottom in subtitles, you know, that's flipping it to the norm. She said everything needs to link back to the company strategy, makes it simple and easy to understand. And she said when you're looking for really cool subject matter experts or people that um, are great to advise you on this type of uh, learning content, she said look out for the people who are in a meeting and you think, wow, brilliant, out of the 10 people that are here, they're here. She said, right. those are the people you should reach out to to get them to go to video. So, John, overall, a fantastic day. It's really nice to be oh, sitting down with you now, having a glass indeed. of wine. I've got to yes, be honest. It's well really. deserved. And thank you very much for um, sharing your um, feedback so fully, um, um, so sensibly, and lots of inspiring stuff there. Pleasure. That's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Thanks to everybody I talked to at this truly international event, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced any of your names. And thanks to our sponsors, Paltoon and Make Real. The Learning Hack is completely independent and transparently funded by sponsorship. Please subscribe on your podcast platform of choice to get future episodes automatically. And if you're keen to help other people find us as well, make sure to give us a five-star rating. You can reach me at John Helmer on Twitter or through my website, johnhelmerconsulting.com. Next time on The Learning Hack, I talk to Leonard Hoot, Casper's and School and eLearning Network about old school instructional design. 
Leonard really knows his stuff and has controversial things to say. Don't miss it. Bye. Now I finally get it. I hope my answers weren't too crazy. Oh, don't worry, I'll edit them out. You know. That's what I do. We are from Norway, so we are overwhelmed. We are not used to these kind of sizes. Or